afternoon, and welcome to week seven of 10 Weeks in Jamaica Theater Conversations from Jamaica to the World. I'm Magdalene Neff, co-founder and co-curator and co-artistic director of Akiva Abaka Arts. We are an international theater production company that creates plays, concerts, talks, and processes for making plays, concerts, and talks for the global stage. This series is presented in partnership with Raw Management Agency, an esteemed talent agency representing artists and groups of cars across all genres in film, television, theater, voiceovers, branding, and endorsements. We are very grateful to work in collaboration with Ms. Nadine Rollins, Raw, Managing, Raw Management's Managing Director and Co-Curator of this series. 10 Weeks in Jamaica, Theater Conversations from Jamaica to the World, is a talk series that shares the behind the scenes stories of Jamaica's theater community with the global theater community and members of the Jamaican and Caribbean diaspora. Each week, Jamaica's leading theater pioneers and practitioners narrate their histories and memories of the Jamaican stage and offer their visions for the future development of theater in this 21st century. This series is made possible by our sponsor and publisher, HowlRound.com, a free and open platform for theater makers worldwide that amplifies progressive, disruptive ideas about the art form and facilitates connections between diverse theater practitioners. 10 Weeks in Jamaica is also sponsored by the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center at the City University of New York in Manhattan. The Siegel Center is a home to theater artists, scholars, students, performing arts managers, and the local international performance communities. Now, whether you're joining us for the first time or you have been watching us weekly since we started this series on November 1st, we thank you very much for being in our audience today and hope that you will return weekly through the end of the series on January 3rd. I like to invite you right now to go ahead and click that subscribe button to become part of our growing family. And hey, click that bell too to be notified of upcoming episodes and engagements from our channel. And while you're at it, follow us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. We are at Akiba Abaka Arts on all platforms. I want to invite you too to drop comments or questions for our panelists right in the chat, okay? During the, um, during the broadcast at any time. Now, at this time, I want to introduce my partner, co-founder and co-artistic director, Akiba Abaka. She is a distinguished director. She is dramatist, producer, actor, and arts educator. She's been bringing theater to diverse communities throughout her 20 plus career. Akiba will be your host and your moderator for today's conversation. Welcome, Miss Akiba. Hello, Miss Magalie. Hello How there. Are <laughs> this is gonna be a wonderful conversation. I'm so happy that we're talking with our playwrights and this week's lineup is a, a group of three Jamaican women playwrights. Yay, women running things. <laughs> we have to big them up, big them up, big up the women. And it's interesting, it, it happened um, by chance, it was just, based on availability. So last week we spoke with the men and this week we're speaking with the women playwrights and you know we're looking for just all the nuances that will come from the conversation. So this is gonna be great. Absolutely. You got your notebook sister? Yes, girl, right here. <laughs> right here, ready to take those notes. <laughs> and you know I always have mine. Okay. <laughs> right. well, thanks, Magalie. Right. At the top of the broadcast, we saw an excerpt of a performance by the Sistrin Theater Collective. Um, and Lana Finnegan, who is executive director of Sistrin, will be joining us today for this conversation in response to George Bernard Shaw's 1911 quote, the next thing you want is a theater with all the ordinary traveling companies from England and America sternly kept out of it. For unless you do your own acting and writing your own plays, your theater will be of no use. It will in fact vulgarize and degrade you. Week two of the conversation with Jamaican playwrights engages 
the statement from Shaw and extends the conversation, looking at the impact of decolonization and diversity in an Afro-Creole society, the intersection of commercial, commercialism and community in the way of making theater and the role of activism in playmaking. Delia Harris is a playwright, actress, television and radio personality and public speaker, as well as a film and theater director. A graduate of the University of the West Indies of, at Mona, Delia majored in English as well as media com communication. Delia has been a part of the local media landscape for almost 25 years. Her first professional play, Judgment, was nominated as the best new Jamaican play and for two consecutive years, her plays God's Way and God's Way Two, Carlton's Redemption, respectively, were winners in that in the category. And this is with the Actor Boy Awards. And for those of you who may know, the Actor Boy Awards is a distinguished um, uh, recognition given by the Critics Circle of Jamaica. It is comparative to the Tony Awards in Jamaica. Delia has written, directed, and produced. Tele for Television Jamaica, the series Ring Games and Love and Dance Hall. And later on, we're gonna hear a little bit about Delia's model for taking the plays from the plays to the screen, from the stage to the screen. And Ring Games, both Ring Games and Love and Dance Hall are two uh, productions that she took from the stage to the screen. Welcome, Delia. Thank you, Akima. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, it's a pleasure to have you. Susan Beadle is a playwright, director, producer, and actor. She is the founder of Soul Art, a faith-based faith production company focusing on family-friendly live performance with a message. Soul Art also has an outreach arm, which hosted its first in a series of webinars titled Open Your Mouth and Talk in May 2020, and has a series of live talks Soul Talk, which tackles topics that are often difficult to navigate. In addition to soul art, Suzanne is the founder and creative director of Tableau, Center for the Performing Arts, which is known for its social justice and advocacy work and for being a voice for the voiceless. Suzanne has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Literature in English and Cultural Studies from the University of the West Indies at Mona. During her times at Mona, she, during her tenure at Mona, she also studied theater and social justice at the Mamlo University in Mamlo, Sweden. Suzanne recently complete, completed her master's degree in creative arts with a distinction at the University of the West Indies in Cave Hill in Barbados. Her work has been recognized by Jamaica's Actor Boy Awards, she is a senior lecturer at the Edna Manley College of Visual and Performing Arts. Welcome, Suzanne. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Hi, Delia. Hey. Lana Finnegan. Through a powerful combination of creative arts and advocacy, Lana Louise Finnegan has led the Sistrin Theater Collective for over 20 years. Sistrin has used Street, street theater to promote discussion about community safety and grassroots organizing since 1977, highlighting programs on gender-based violence, crime prevention, and HIV AIDS through community mobilizing and organizing around community development, gender-based violence analysis, and discussion of possible solutions through networking and organizations with organizations at all levels, consistently using the creative arts as a tool for social change. Lana has also served as a project director, co-trainer and facilitator for Groups Jamaica, emphasizing safety in cities and communities through local to local dialogues and implementing safety audits. Lana has a leading role in monitoring and reviewing progress and challenges in the implementation of global development policies and commitments such as the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, 
the and the new urban agenda in mainstreaming a gender pers perspective and women's empowerment in the UN. Lana was appointed in, in the Caribbean Civil Society Organizations and Networks Committee and received the Otto Rene Castillo Award for Political Theater from the Castillo Theater Center in New York City. Welcome, Lana. Thanks for having me, Akiba. Welcome to be here, Dela and Susan. Glad to be on the, in the same space with you guys. Looking forward to a very, very robust discussion this evening. And Thank robust you. it will be. I want to start off by <laughs> I want to start off by just talking a little bit about the work that you are creating. Um, where is your work centered? What part of Jamaican society? is your work centered? Um, what inspires your work? And I want to start with Dahlia. Um, you know, to be honest, Akiba, if I had to say a particular socio-demographic or geopolitical area, then I'd probably be lying <laughs> because I think I am more led by issues that happen and, you know, issues happen across um, class and race and, and demographies. And so most of what I engage with are things that I believe are persistent issues in the society, things like gender-based violence, um, the ways in which we engage with, with history and, and how um, we are all the praise of our past, you know, and, and how do we continue or discontinue some of the things that, that we bring from colonization into the present space. And so I I am... That's what I want to engage in. A lot of what I do as well is communication for social and behavior change. Mm -hmm. And so most of what I engage with is placed within um, human attitudes and perceptions and behavior. And, and in what ways can I get us to, I guess, pay closer attention to why we do what we do mm -hmm. and, and how can we change the things that we do. Amazing. Thank you. Suzanne. If we're looking at the work that you write, the work that you create, what part of Jamaican society are we looking at? Or is your um, narrative arc similar to Delia's? Okay, so for me, through Tableau, we focused on being a voice for the voices. So we did a lot of work on anti-LGBT discrimination or anti-sexism, anti-homophobia, you know? Um, speaking out for abused women or abused children and those kinds of representations. Um, and, and we've done that over the years. But one of the things, as uh, you know, as I've spoken of uh, before that I'm interested in is representation on stage of all facets of Jamaica. And so pretty much like Dahlia, I, for, for Soul Art, we want to have theater that has a message and the message could come from anywhere because Jamaica is multifaceted. Mm -hmm. And so now we focus on having, you know, theater so that when you leave our productions, you, you're, you're talking, you're, you're discussing, you're asking questions, you're disagreeing with us, you're agreeing with us, you know, we want to start conversations and those conversations can come from anywhere. So I wouldn't necessarily narrow it down to a particular demographic either. Fantastic. Lana Finnegan, Miss Lana Finnegan, you've been, I'd say you've been in the trenches. Um, you know, you are a true liberation arts theater maker, Sistrin. I remember studying Sistrin in, in college. Tell us a little bit about the work that Sistrin creates. What are we going to see at a Sistrin production? Basically, our work is really around the same issues that Delia and uh, Susan speak about but our focus is mainly grassroots women and grassroots community. But at the same time, we also work and look at issues that impact the rest of the women within the society and across the region and across the world. And our work stems from personal experience and women experience from within the community. So any given time you might come to one of our productions is about issues that are impacting women. It's about um, housing, it's about um, pregnant, teenage pregnancy, it's about sexual violence, it's about abuse, it's about gender violence, it's about community violence, it's about domestic violence, it's about um, 
how women relates to men, how men relates to women, and also how does do we use theater as a way of making social change within the space that we work with and engage communities to understand that they can use the arts as a tool to advocate, not just for the local authorities or the, the, the space that they're in, but other stakeholders, government, police, um, local authorities, businesses, um, corporate Jamaica, et cetera, and also how they can work across communities to engage each other and talk about peace and, and development for their community. Fantastic. Well, you know, you heard this quote from George Bernard Shaw. And to our listeners, our viewers, do feel free to drop in the chat your reflection on Shaw's quote. This idea that Jamaican, that in order to have a Jamaican theater, you had to reflect the stories of the Jamaican people in all of its um, diversities. Um, rather than just the stories of a Western culture. So feel free to pose questions to the speakers in the chat or even give your own response. But for now, I toss this to the speakers. What do you think? What is your reflection on Shaw's statement? If Shaw were to visit Kingston today, what would he say of the Jamaican stage? Anyone, we could start with Delia, we could start with Lana, any, Suzanne, anyone can respond. Uh, all right, I'll start. For me, um, despite his good intentions, <laughs> I, I believe that for sure to come from his own lens of Western theater and Western discourse, it, it really would be impossible for him to try to advise Jamaican what a Jamaican theater aesthetic should be. Because there are elements to our theater aesthetic that would not be present in Western discourse. So for example, one of the things he's talking about is, is the writing of stories. Um, but in the Jamaican context, we, we don't just write, we tell mm -hmm. and we perform yeah. stories. And so theater in, in the material sense of the building and the structured theater may not necessarily be the kind of theater that is Jamaican theater. Jamaica is coming from even um, an Afro-Creole religious type of revival, kumina, pokomania, performative space that in itself is theater. It's, it's, it's a religious spiritual performance, which our history will tell us Western discourse did not have the capacity to understand um, or to appreciate. And so I, I see that, you know, his intentions are, I believe, to at some level say, well, it must reflect who you are and it should um, sustain your, your, your culture as a people. But I don't know if within the context of what he was offering as the aesthetic would necessarily work for us here as, as Jamaican theatre. Hmm. What are your reflections? Uh, uh, or he, yes. Okay. For me, um, I agree with Delia because, for instance, sistering theater and performances that we do can be do can be done in any space. It can be done on stage. It can be done on the street corner. It can be done in an auditorium. It can be done in, on your veranda. It can be done anywhere because of how we use the popular theater, which is um, the drums, the dance, whatever it is. And it's, it's on any space that you can, can bring that performance to anybody and have a discussion because sistering productions are not just theater for theater purposes, but theater for um, engaging and advocating and getting you, steering you up to action. So you can ensure that when you you see a production or, 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 or a skit or a dramatic presentation, it really engages you and stimulates your mind and have you starting a discussion and asking questions about characters, about the issues that are coming out of those um, pieces that we put together and put, and, and put forward to any audience. Right, and I, I just wanted to add another dimension perhaps because I don't think that 
uh, as Dalia has said, someone coming from outside of our space can dictate what our theatre should be. And I think that our theatre is also a showcasing of our talents. And so if I, as a playwright, decide to write a story that's not Jamaican or Caribbean or doesn't look like us, it is still showcasing my talent. Is it not therefore Caribbean theatre? It's, a, it's a, a, a debate my students have every year. What makes Caribbean theatre? Is it the person who writes it? coming from the Caribbean that makes it Caribbean, or is it what is on the stage? So if an American writes a Caribbean story, is it Caribbean theater? If a Caribbean person writes a European story, is it Caribbean theater? And so I think that we decide what our theater is and what we decide to put out and to present as Caribbean theater. And all of it is Caribbean theater and it should all be allowed because it's coming from us. Ooh. I love this because a few weeks ago, we were talking about decolonizing pantomime, right? And we think about, so I, I really love where you're coming from as far as um, if we do it, it's Caribbean theater, no matter who the story is. It's, it, it's not about colonizing or de, not decolonizing for you. It's about our artistic expression. It's about our stamp on the work. Is that what you're saying? Yes, and the or... The or is important. Who is the or? Because remember that we have many kinds of or here in the Caribbean. Talk about it. You know, you know, if you go to, to Trinidad and you look at the Indian community, that's or. And it might not look to someone like Bernard Shaw as a Caribbean look because of what he, through his lenses, considers to be Caribbean or to be Jamaican or, you know. So or is the important word that you're using. What we choose to create as Jamaican creatives makes it Jamaican theatre and therefore it's authentic Jamaican theatre, I think. So whether you're, you're telling a story of, of Anansi or you're telling the story of um, Anastasia, if you're telling the story in Jamaica, it's Jamaican theatre. Or if even if you're not to... telling, the... sorry, oh, Dale, go ahead. I, I, I was saying we have to we have to appreciate as well that Jamaica is cosmopolitan. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. when we talk about Jamaica, we talk about Jamaicans in the diaspora. We talk about so are the Jamaican stories of people in diaspora not Jamaican stories are are exactly. stories of um, expats who are now living in Jamaica, not Jamaican stories. Yeah. So it, it's. I think one of the things is um, they try to ground what is Caribbean in how it speaks to issues that are Caribbean issues of history, culture, and, 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 and other things. But then our history is a cosmopolitan history. And so I believe that unlike, I, I think maybe some parts of the world, we have to embrace that for Jamaica, a lot of who we are comes from many places and, and diverse backgrounds and diverse right. experiences. And if we are going to say, well, we have to embrace all, how do we decide what what do we embrace and, and what don't we embrace? Right. So it, yeah. You know, this makes me want to jump into the, um, into the conversation on language that was started last week with the uh, Basil Dawkins and David Tuller and Fabian Thomas. Because when we talk about, as I'm listening to you, I'm hearing where language really plays into what is the, the story, what is the narrative of Jamaican people, right? And many people would see language as a barrier, right? What is the Jamaican language? What is English? But tell me, how does language factor into the work that you are creating and also the Jamaicanization or the Caribbeanization of theater. Lana. For me, it, it depends on, on where we are coming from because if, if you are looking at certain issues, for instance, um, if, if we have to go into a particular community to do a particular issues around um, domestic violence, then you have to be possibly we tailor the production to that audience that we are speaking to. If we are moving into the theater space, then we will now look at how we will still have our 
local language, but at the same time, how do we ensure that we speak English in a way that the audience who are there can understand what it, what, what it is that we are saying? Also, for me, language is... Um, it's different across the Caribbean and it's different even within Jamaica space itself. Because if we go across the 14 parishes, we get 14 different um, patois or dialect and we get 14 different broken English that, 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 that is we speak. And, um, and for instance, if I go to St. James and we do something in St. James, um, it depends on the character that we are using. I remember when we were doing a research around um, women in sugar, and we went to Clarendon in A's to do a skit to start a conversation, and we were doing a skit around um, mothers who have to go to work and leave their children in daycare or with families, etc. And when we started to do the presentation, there was a woman, a woman in the audience named Miss Iris. And immediately Miss Iris started to quarrel with the residents from Ace Community that they told us her story so we could put it in the presentation and bring it to them. And we had to stop the, the skit mm -hmm. and explain to Miss Iris that no, this is our personal story. This is our life we are bringing to you. And that was the only way she was convinced that the resident and her neighbors did not tell us anything about her life story and what she was going through. So Miss Iris was seeing her narrative, her story reflected back on reflected stage. Reflected back on she, stage. In and she front thought of her, her neighbors were, were carrying news on her. On her. Yeah. They, carrying news back and forth about her. Yeah. You know, that speaks to the power of language because one aspect of language, regardless of, um, because when we think of language, we think of um, it, 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 its category, whether it's Spanish, English, Jamaican, yeah, Norman, yeah. right? But when we think about language, what you're describing is here is Miss Iris able to see aspects of her life mm -hmm. displayed on the stage. Right in front of her. Right. Yeah. felt something, right? She feels something. She feels her life being reflected back to her. So as we think about language and aesthetics, and I also want us to, I would love to hear your reflection on this idea of centering English as the default language of, I know it's called the English speaking Caribbean, but in the theater do you, that you make, do you center English as, you, as the language or are you centering um, aesthetics that's closer to the, the lives that your audiences may, may lead or may not lead. For, 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 you know, for, us, at, for us at Sistry, that is what we do. We center it to the audience that we are depicting the information to. Mm -hmm. So if it has to do with some English, we will put it there. But oh, most of the time, it is in the language that... Um, our women, our men, our boys, and our girls are comfortable in, in, in understanding. Mm -hmm. Suzanne? Yeah, I, I wanted to say something. I, I think language is not just spoken. And I think Jamaican theater is rich in unspoken language. And I'll share a story with you. I went with the National Pantomime Company back in the 90s to Leeds in England. Mm -hmm. And we had a, an Anansi story that was yes. a pantomime at the time. And it was heavily Jamaican, Jamaican language. And we didn't adjust it. We had a daytime show with 200, 300 primary school children from Leeds, white children. And they followed the story entirely. And we could tell from their reaction. Mm -hmm. They knew who the bad guy was, who the good guy was, what the fight was, what the story was. They knew. And sometimes I think we overplay this barrier that language is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And if, if we all don't speak the Queen's English, we're not communicating. That's crazy. You know, narrative and language is not just about what we speak. And there are many ways to communicate. And we, I think one of the strengths of Jamaican theatre is that we can communicate across all kinds of barriers. And so when we zone in on this thing about language, I think we do ourselves a disservice. Mm -hmm. 
the I unspoken, yes, oh. the unspoken language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to say that um, it, it would also be a little hypocritical, well, of, of me, I wouldn't say of us, to pretend to represent languages that um, we, we have no idea of. Lana's theater, for example, goes into the community, and so they capture the nuances and the syntax of, of what the words and the phrases mean. And Miss Lou did that very well because mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as a social worker herself and Rani Williams um, went around the island. And so you find that a lot of what she wrote would capture, for example, naming as a, as mm -hmm. a Jamaican style. So once a year, says somebody named um, Nuffy, the one Nuffy um, captures in one word what it would probably require a paragraph in English mm -hmm. to explain the personality. Um, but that's one of the things about Jamaican language, the ways in which, so there, so there are idiosyncrasies about it that mm -hmm. I feel make it a little bit different. And, and we do a certain type of theater. I, I have to big up um, someone like Andrea Del Cita Wright, because when Del Cita um, references certain things, that I have no knowledge of. And then you see the audience that she speaks to and the way that they respond because of the mm -hmm. language that she uses. Um, often as a playwright, um, Fabian Barracks writes for high school children and their language is a totally different language than mine. Language. And, so, and so I like to recognize um, that different writers and different styles will, will have impact at different levels. We'll write a play in Jamaica, but when we get to the States and we know we're performing for second and third generation Jamaicans, we have to, trust me, uh, sanitize some of the language so that they understand what we're saying. And these are still Jamaican and Caribbean audiences. But if we do it like we do it here in a Jamaica, they can't understand what we're saying. And so we have to make a deliberate effort to change it. And so even coming out of this conversation, I believe is a realization for me and, and many writers that language is, is political, you know? And that the audience, <laughs> a lot of the times determines the language that we use right now, we have a discussion about film. Um, people say they're talking Jamaican in film, but we said that must sound Jamaican. And, and then I said to them, yeah, but we watch African film and I don't think Africans speak that way either, but that's how we understand it. And so we're okay with it. So are we not okay when the same thing happens to us? So it's always trying to find that place where as a writer, um, you're expressing what you want to express, but 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 also that the transaction is speaking and hearing, and that they understand what you are also trying to say. Mm -hmm. You know, you you're entering into a great place around the language because I, I think the conversation on language stays in the, at the surface too often, because that point that you make about um, about naming, you know, what we call really dubbing, you know. Um, my, my mom used to say the part of Jamaica she's from, she said, I never wanted to do anything bad in Jamaica up there because next thing you know, you would get that name. So if you, if you, if you were the person who, who, who killed somebody's goat, you would get a name, something like Goaty or Teefing or something. Somebody would know everything about you based on the name that the people in the, in the town dub you as. But that is such, it's as funny and it's as, um, there's irony in there. But that is a part of the way people communicate. You know, you did something wrong and you, that's, that wrong is going to stay with you forever, right? And if you were going to write a play about some, that person, you're going to give them that name. The act that they did follows them through life, right? And that's a part of the communication. I also really love what you all are talking about when you, you, you incorporate gesture. You know, one of the things with uh, with um, with our language is there is a lot of you know we may kiss our we may suck our teeth right we suck air through our teeth we say kiss your teeth <laughs> um, and depending on the sound of it right it depend it, it lets you know whether somebody's happy whether they're sad 
whether they're about to give you a good proper cursing after, you know, you talk about the work of Louise Bennett Coverly and, and her traveling around the, the, the country and picking up these nuances in our language. Um, outside of English, so Jamaica, I'm gonna step a little further into this language question. Jamaica is a country with many, 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 many cultures, many, mm -hmm. you know, European, mm -hmm. Southeast Asian, Asian, white, expat, everybody's in Jamaica, everybody's in the Caribbean. Is there a collective understanding around language that one would see in the Jamaican theater, whether it's expressed through the body, through verbal communication, gesture, it, does that, where, where does that, where could you identify that? <laughs> you know, Akiba, I'm laughing. <laughs> I say why I'm laughing. Yes. Because I, I've had this discussion about Jamaican film, that there's a way in which we say to Jamaican actors, you do too much on film. And, and you need to bring it in and you need to, and, 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 and that's a Hollywood style of okay. expression. When I watch African film, there is a moment when they're bringing it in, but there is a moment when they're expressing themselves and all the gestures come in and uh, all everything, everything that their natural self because that's how they express themselves. Mm -hmm. And I find that even in, in theater sometimes, um, you will hear, oh, that was too much on the stage. And, and, and that was, but, but, but do we know people like that in real life in Jamaica who are too much? And, and that is how they express themselves in real life and that's how they behave. And so we, and, and, and we, we tend to use it as a demarcation of, Oh, they can do that in popular theater or what, what for a long time we call roots. And we say, oh yeah, that can that can work in a roots theater, but 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 in a more theater, mainstream. We don't <laughs> do that. You have no, to tone it, you have that. to tone it down a little bit. You right. Have to turn down the volume right. a little bit. Right. So it's it's always been a challenge for me because I feel um, like we, we're, we're so, I, I said this someone the other day, and I'm sorry if I'm taking too long to get to it's, it's, we were They were talking about, uh, I read something and like they said, if we were a little bit more exposed to Shakespeare, you know, it would improve our style. And I said, well, maybe you need to be a little bit more exposed to Mikhail Bakhtin, who, who engages in the carnivalesque. And, and I say, and I find that's the problem. You know, you all lock on to one thing and you don't realize that there was African theater, French theater, and that different theater had different styles. And so when you put us in a basket and say, this is what it is because this is what English was. And to some extent, American, I, I believe it is just so unfair to the, to the depth and the scope of who we are as a people. Mm -hmm. But Dela, do you think is that sometime is that some some of us or the audience seeing themselves the mirror of themselves and they, they they are trying to, to 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 push back from it because um there are there are times when a character goes on stage of a particular um class or a particular person and when for us, when the production is finished, somebody come backstage and, as you said, ask, why did you have to depict that person in that way? And I'm saying, we're saying, but, but that's reality. That's, that's how, how the person would, would react. How, that's how the person would, is, is. And that is what we are putting up. We are putting real theater out there. And if you can't stand that, then too bad for you. But Lana, we also have to appreciate that within every space, there's difference, you know, and I'm laughing because I wrote a play about ghetto, um, Baka Yard, and I grew up on St. John's Road, and so I brought to the, to the play a lot of things that were my personal experiences, and somebody comes to the play and they say, Delia, but they didn't need to lick some domino or, or some gunshot, should I do that fire? 
you know, the background. And I said, not this get a community, though. Know. Maybe in another get a community, but this one never really have no gunshot of fire. And so Thank sometimes you. we have to be careful. Even when I did um, country wedding, before I wrote it, someone said to me they had a real concern in the way we represent rural people in place. Mm -hmm. She said we we'll always represent rural people as being illiterate. We always represent them as a little country bunking. Um, who's so unaware and, and 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 she said, listen, when I came to Kingston, um, my my English was way better than everybody else's. And if you to my house, one, true, I agree yes, with her. And if you came to my house, issues like etiquette and my parents were very British. So for you to keep, um, you know, representing all rural people in Jamaica as a country bunking was right. offensive to her, and I had to really take that criticism and say, all right, I'm going to do a play where the country person is not that person. And so, you know, it, 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 that's why it's important to have theater, I believe, everywhere, have it everywhere, because from our own experiences, we, we cannot, cannot represent everyone because our own experiences limit us. Um, and so I feel that we have to get to a space where there, there are more places of expression and more opportunities for people to show who they are and for us mm -hmm. to be able to, to understand how they operate. You know, Suzanne, that's a really great point, Delia, about the need. I often say you do need more theater. I think there isn't enough theater. Yeah. And Suzanne, the, the question of, uh, of language and all of its, capacity, right? Language in gesture, language in um, words and letters, because that's only one form. Um, but language, as far as the lived experiences of, of the people who inspire your pen, what are some of, do you find any aspects of the Jamaican, do you find the, the, the structural aspect of the Jamaican theater, the difference between the commercial theater, the, the plays that are being funded by the corporate corporate Jamaica that will put their brand on, on the play and community theater, the theater that probably the corporate brand, that's not the, where we want our brand to be in alignment. Are you finding that language comes into play there for you as far as the difference between commercialization in theater and the ability to reach specified communities? Right. Well, first of all, I wanted to ask you which plays are the ones that are being sponsored by corporate Jamaica, but that's a whole nother story altogether. Wishful thinking. <laughs> Wishful thinking. Um, yeah, you know, unfortunately, we we have a reality that 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 requires us as producers of theatre, or back when theatre did a key, but um, as producers of theatre to speak the commercial language if we want to be successful because unfortunately theatre is very expensive and unfunded. And so even as we strive to give voice to issues and people that aren't necessarily mainstream, we still have to have in the back of our minds, okay, how are we going to afford to do this? How are we going to make money? How are we going to be able to pay our actors? You know, there are certain realities. You have to be able to speak a financial language. Um, you, you, as much as we would love to do theater just for art or just for advocacy, that's not the reality in Jamaica. And we have to find a way to, to, to strike a balance of being true to, to the, the, the representation. Because one of the things I, I fear is a strong word, but you know, I, I really would hate to happen is if I were to produce a play and someone would see themselves represented on stage and feel that it was an inauthentic representation. So even as we try to navigate showing real stories of real people in authentic ways, we always in the back of our mind have to have that business part of show business in, in the back of our mind. You know, we, can't, we just can't get around it. There, there, there isn't enough support to Jamaican theatre from whomever, be it government or commercial, you know, private sector, whatever it is. There just isn't enough. And so the producers have to have that in mind. 
they have to constantly be navigating those two worlds to try to strike the right balance. And you know, go ahead. I was just saying it's unfortunate. There are a few people who have managed successfully to do that in a sustained way, daily or being one of them, you know. Um, I, I honestly don't know how she do it because I, you know, every time I put on a production, sometimes I'm sure when Dela said that is my name come up on her phone, she's like, Lord, have mercy, Dela. But, you know, one of the things I wanted to touch on also was that this collaborative effort that Jamaican theater needs to have, mm -hmm. and it does in some ways, but it needs more of it where we're all supporting each other. You know, Dela always speaks about collaboration and you know, if I have something that she needs and she has something that I need, why can't we help each other to make us both successful? Mm -hmm. And that, that is what we've had to be doing because there isn't enough support, you know, but unfortunately we have to try and straddle both worlds in order to be successful. You know, Lana, you've been creating, you've been making theater through Sistrin um, for over 40 years. Sistrin uh, theater Collective has been working in some of the more marginalized communities in Jamaica. And how do you navigate doing work at, which incorporates art making, activism, um, protections, you know, people and healing, healing from trauma? How do you navigate that in a space that is not heavily funded? Um, and also, your work is not going to really transfer to the commercial space, um, like the work of a Shibata or a Del Cita, even though these are really brilliant pieces and, and deal with similar issues, but deal with them using more comedy and farce. Well, what is that I, like for you? As I said before, is that um, in the early days, you, we, as, as, as Susan speaks to, that you used to have the kind of support in funding to do the kind of work that you do, and um, and even to continue um, community theater that we are doing now is that we are minimally funded by overseas funders to carry out the work, or you are contracted by a particular agency or a government ministry or whoever it is to carry out a set of work a set in a set period, and um, and that is how you get to do the work that we want to do and needs to do. The next thing is, as Susan and, and Dela was saying, is that um, corporate Jamaica has to see their, how are they going to benefit from this product? How are their product going to be sold, sold or whatever it is as part of this process? And I remember when we were doing uh, domestic violence um, series in some particular inner city communities. And we went to a, pick, a particularly um, um, company that deals with um, products that, 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 that they sell to women. Mm -hmm. And as Delia said the other day, we have to sell the products so they understand that if you support us, then these are the women who are buying the product that you are selling. And if you become part of and engage us in this process, then at least you will benefit more from women buying your product, et cetera. And that is how you have to engage companies for them to understand how best they can benefit from it, um, being part and parcel of what it is that you are trying to do and convince them that, they can benefit from, from any performances that is yeah. and all of those stuff basically. And what mm -hmm. about, so there's a question of branding then, right? There's a question of um, align your brand in this community for this particular impact. And, you know, I, I, I think that there is, there's good and bad to that, right? Because, as writers, are you writing to seek brand alignment from a corporation or are you a writing to impact or to awaken or to, to, to help audiences, to help people feel something about themselves, know more about themselves than 
they sometimes, this is the thing about the theater is you're locked in that room for a good hour, hour and a half, two hours, right? The average mm-hmm. person is not just going to get up and walk out of the theater. They're going to sit there and they're not, they're not, they can't change the channel. Very rarely, because nobody wants to be seen getting up and walking out. So there's this moment where you are able to captivate your audience. Mm-hmm. And when you're captivating your audience, what are you working towards in the stories that you're telling them? And is there a way for the impact that those stories that you're telling your audience to get translated to funders, to commercials? So they're funding the impact rather than funding just the impact of butts in seats, but they're funding the impact of change. Yeah. transformation within human beings and how mm-hmm. that translates into the community. Less violence, more love, more collective mm-hmm. thinking, reasoning. Mm-hmm. Akiba, there's a, wonderful, <laughs> there's a wonderful thing called um, ROI, return on investment. Okay. And, and I find that within the language of ROI, all that you just said about empowerment and, and, and uplift does not exist. So they Ooh. want they want to know. Mm-hmm. So if, if you are able to say, listen, this play, first of all, you have to tell them that this play go have this amount of people coming yep. to watch. Yep. So part yep. of the ROI mm-hmm. is if this is the audience engagement that you will have. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of the script. They want to make sure that the brand is probably aligned with, with happiness and fun and wonderful memories and something that's going to make when people come out of the fair today and say, oh, I feel so good. So, so when we want to engage um, stories that will cause people to be self-reflective and have people to, to sit down and say, wow, you know, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't, maybe. I... Mm-hmm. And, and most importantly, we have to also remember that the, the people who are the decision makers mm-hmm. also comprise our audience. And in some instances, they don't. And let me qualify that. So when you say, I'm going to do a play, and the person who is engaging you says, oh, I don't really watch Jamaican theater, then there is a dissonance that you will never overcome. Because... Mm-hmm. For you to say this is what theater is going to do, they don't watch it, they don't support it, they don't know what it is, yep. and so for you to say this is what it's going to do means absolutely nothing to them. Nothing to them. Mm-hmm. No, they know. They know that when they go on Instagram, they search people page and find things. So if you're an influencer, they'll give you money because a search page. So if I search your page, um, somebody else is probably searching your page as well. But the idea. Of um, a Jamaica, if you if we do a survey now with CEOs and marketing managers and say, do you watch Jamaican theater? If you do, what do you want? Well, it would be shocking to many of us. I'm telling you. Mm-hmm. And government yeah. shows as well because I pointed that out as well. That I've, yes. I've, I've done plays and I can't count on my hand how many people from government ha- leave them yard to come and watch. Mm-hmm. Jamaican theater. So when we yeah. so we talk about language, mm-hmm. when we try to engage them in the language mm-hmm. of what we do and how it works, this on us. Yep. Yeah, make the can make a, a connection to it at all. But but do you know, um Delio, two of your plays come to mind, and I don't know that they're not making the connection, they're just not interested in, in backing it. I think of of um to the finish, and I think of her last cry, and I think of how obvious it was the kind of necessary conversation those two productions were. To the finish dealt with drugging in 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 in, in the, the youth athletic program in Jamaica at a time when our athletics program was on the heights of heights, and everybody who came, all the officials who came to watch it, lauded it for how real it was and how important it was and how impactful it was that so they knew nobody decided, you know what, let's get this out to the young people. Let's get this out to the athletics teams. 
at the primary level. Get it into schools. Level. Yes, so that's what I mean. At the primary or secondary level. Nobody. So it's all about talk. You know, her last cry was about domestic violence. It played in Kingston. It played in Montego Bay. It was a powerful production. Mm-hmm. Where was the support? The people would come if they came, if they came because, as you know, some of them say, "Oh, I don't watch Jamaican theater." Um, and they saw and they would talk and say all the right things. Oh, this is so powerful. This is so impactful. But there was nothing behind it. Can I tell you so I it, something starting for you? I wrote I wrote a bunch of CEOs, and and this might just be anecdotal, but I found it interesting. All the female CEOs told me no. The male CEO. Um, bought tickets. For oh, for which one? Her last cry. Her last cry. Domestic violence against <laughs> domestic violence against women. Right, and I right. wrote a bunch of women CEOs, and I said, you know, they're women, and they will understand the importance of something like this, and buying tickets and sending. Not one female CEO responded favorably to my mm-hmm. request. The only and person who responded was the male CEO. He didn't come, but he said, I'll buy some tickets and I'll support the, the, the cause. To the finish about drugs in sports, the international um, body, Athletic and um, World Anti-Doping Agency, endorsed mm. the show. I couldn't get the local people mm. to endorse the show. So those mm-hmm. are some of the... Lana, you, let me, I'm going to jump in here because as I listen to this conversation, I, I have another question that's going to provoke um, Delia to say, Akiba, so I hope I, I, want that, I want that, you know, I want that expression from, um, from Delia. But Lana, you want to speak to, to this um, place of commercialism and community, something you wanted to say. No, I was responding to Delia's that the, the, the woman CEO would not um, come because from where I sit is that the issues in that production might be staring them right in their face and they don't want to accept that this is happening to them. I remember when we were at drama school and we were doing a product, a skit around um, DVD, uh, which is domestic violence. And inside of, of, of the space, um, when we did the, 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 the 10 minutes presentation, there was a, a woman from the inner city look at the middle class and whoever they were and said, until you guys leave where you are and join us in this struggle and admit that what is happening to us in our community is happening to you. And one of the person get up and says that um, Mm. she can't afford to give away the lifestyle that she is living. Yep. Yep. It's interesting so she, that you're saying that. No, Lana is Lana. Finnegan is Finnegan. And that is what Sistry does. We, we, just, we just straight up, we don't, we don't go around the bush. Yeah. And she said that she ain't going to give up that lifestyle. And mm-hmm. we were lucky enough, Akiba, Suzanne, and Delia, to start a series of workshops out of that presentation with those women. And yeah. it was in those workshops that they started to start to engage and talking about the black eye, the blue eye, the, the, the swelling on the arms mm-hmm. and the, 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 the bus mouth and whatever it is. And start yeah. to realize how important it is that both sides of the fence have to come together to start admitting that these things are happening and the car and the credit card and the debit card and the the chain and the the position that they have and the position that they have is going to take their life Mm -hmm. yes i want to i wanted to share something lana because it's you know i'm getting goosebumps now you're talking about that this last year i was in barbados 
And we started our Oatmeal Mouth and Talk series. And the tagline for Oatmeal Mouth and Talk is empowering this female voice. And I was fortunate enough to, to have met um, an organization there called National Organization of Women. Uh-huh. And when we were this, we partnered together. Yeah. We partnered together to do this. And when we started, the suggestion was made about what about the middle, the middle class, upper class woman? Mm-hmm. What about their voices and the, the silencing of those women? And it became apparent to me that doing something in an open, free for all forum to address the middle class, upper class issue will not happen. No, we had no. to plan a closed event that was private and secure. Well, COVID hit and we had to move it online, but still, we had to plan it in a way that they felt that their mask could come off because either because of who their husband is or who their father is or who who their boss is, the position that they have in society, they are not willing to to shape that facade. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're fearful. That's a part of it as well. Yeah, that's a part of it. Also, you know, they, they, they don't know how not to have that lifestyle. And so there's that whole that whole side of society that doesn't necessarily get represented because they're afraid of representing themselves in a, in an open way. And so we have to, as Lana said, go into some kind of closed session where they start feeling freedom to speak. And, and we, you know, as she's speaking, I remember because I was so puzzled. I was like, you know, why would you not? You know, in the same way I felt about the, um, the, the Her Last Cry production, why would you not want to support this? I, I don't understand. But then so, so many of us are hiding and, and theatre is a way that we can we can try to begin these conversations. You know, I'm going to jump, you know. in, jump into the space here. We, our Q&A, our um, chat is starting to, to liven up and we're getting a few questions in the chat. One of our, our audience members who's been following us from week one, Chris Alid, offers a wonderful question. In, to engage what you're bringing up here. And Chris wants to know, do you think that the mindset of our audiences for theater is then more about escapism than yeah. to face real serious issues? Yep. Yes. Yep. And then Absolutely. I have a follow-up question for you. Absolutely. So Absolutely. You about that escapism then? Yes, people will say they come to the theater to laugh. They, they, their, their life is hard. They don't want to see it reflected on theater. Yeah. They don't want to see it reflected on the stage in that way. They want to see a light, even if they want to see the issues, they want it presented in a lighthearted, more palatable way. Yeah. And so they, they, will, they will tell you they come to the theater to laugh and to forget for two hours about the hardships. Yeah. So part yeah. of the style that most of us end up doing now, um, Akiva, is what we call... Um, it, it's um it's a you know it's a syncretism of drama and comedy. I hear. So um yeah because we want to, as the artist, hit the emotional notes. But if we're only hitting emotional notes, um we're gonna also hit <laughs> the barely hit some bone and the bankrupt and the financial notes. So we have to end up, and, 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 and Lennon and Suzanne will tell you, we'll be in the middle of a moment on stage and, and the slightest thing that will give them the, the escape route to laugh out or to say something to break the tension, it happens because they don't want to have to deal with, with this. So yeah, we, so, so for most of what we do, we, we've had to, and I find it interesting because some of the most popular Television shows are not common. Dramas, yeah. We, we, we watch the soap operas, and the soap opera them full of drama from day one till, you know what I mean? And, and we, watch, we will watch those things in another space, mm-hmm. but in our own Jamaican space, we, we, we don't want to engage it. We want to get the laughter and take kid teeth and keep a heart on Absolutely. And that's what we want to do. So do you see any transference of that in Jamaican society? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of shift into a, a little bit of um, talking about the collective consciousness or consciousnesses, because, you know, 
the collective consciousness is what we all understand about ourselves as a group. What do we all know about ourselves? So we just, one big one big collective consciousness among Jamaicans is is the motto. We like to say, "Out of many, we are one." Right? Because if you if you attack a black Jamaican, the white Jamaicans are gonna say, "Out of many, we are one." If you attack a white Jamaican, the black Jamaicans are going to say, hey, don't do that. Out of many, we're one. So that's one, you know, or the uh, Asian Jamaican or uh, uh, Indian Jamaican, we're one. So that's one collective consciousness, right? Reggae is a part of our collective consciousness, right? So when I think, when I hear that there are aspects of our lives, those that may be traumatic and those that add to our growth. So for example, the woman, the country woman saying, there's not just one story of the country Jamaican. There's the countryside. There's, you know, it's not all country bumpkin. You know, when I hear you hear her story, I think about the folks from the countryside where my folks are from. You know, um, they spent quite a bit of time in England, so they have their own stories. You know, mm -hmm. but um, as I think about this collective consciousness, how is the I feel in a lot of ways, and if I pass my place, put my back in, in order, but I feel in a lot of ways that the, there are so, the barriers are so tight, right? That the, the ability for theater to inform and impact and expand upon the collective consciousness is being limited by its visibility and its access to funding. And I feel like, we don't need it. Forget about funding. Make theater. Delia, you have created a model where you premiere your plays in the theater and then you continue those plays to the screen, to television, right? So we have, um, we have Love and Dance Hall as one example of that. And is, is, is that one way that you are kind of countering this space, kind of breaking out of the, the barrier Mm -hmm. of funding and financing to reach. Are you finding that your plays are reaching a non-theater audience? And is that shifting some of the collective consciousness among people in Jamaica? Um, so it's twofold. It, it, so first of all, I mean, it happens only because I have a boss that loves theater. Mm. <laughs> that's the bottom line because I think a lot of people see it happen and they say, oh, did it? I mean, Suzanne knows it's been a six-year journey to get it to where it is. So people see it now and they think, Chuck, it's been a six-year journey of negotiating and, and trying to say, hey, well, let's do this. Let's do that. This can work. And, 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 and it's been that way. One of the, the, the concerns I had about the stage to screen was that if we start putting all the stage on screen, then people won't want to come to this physical space anymore. Mm -hmm. So we'll say, okay, we're going to open a play. And they'll say, oh, well, I don't have to go because it's going to come on TV. So I can't watch it on TV. And, um, you know, it, it's never the same experience, the live audience and, and the singing yeah. on television. And so eventually one of the things I tried to do was to, change the name, change the style. So even though initially it's in the theater space, um, ring games and love and dance hall, tried as best as it could within limits to not come across as a stage play. Mm. Because yeah, because I, 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 my thing is not to counter the work of what stage is doing. And then have people say, oh, well, I can watch this free at home. So I don't want to go to the physical space and support nobody. So, so that's that's been one of the challenges, but it it has opened up, um, I think more more space in terms of people appreciating um, the talent that we have in Jamaica. Um, people seeing different stories. When I heard I'm talking about her last cry, I see a lady and she said, "You yeah, may not understand how a big woman like you make the man a beat you in other house." And I said to her, you know, it was important for me to do that because I think people feel that in order for you to be abused, you have to be a little petty thing um, that physically can't fight back, but abuse is so many different levels. Yeah. So it, it, for me, it's opening that space. And, and, and Akiba, I know you don't know, and Susan and Lana, I do a Women in Theater Festival. Mm -hmm. um, Sister was my 
And so each year was I do identify three people or organizations that we honor. And Sistrin was one of them for the work that they've done as women in the Jamaica theater landscape. And then each night we do plays written by women, plays starring women, plays directed by women, because at one point I felt it was important for women to feel as if they owned a place in the Jamaica theater space. Mm. And that that space could be more consistent. And so even on television, um, my team, a lot of women, the production team, everybody. So it, it's it, it's trying to make the, the play. I just don't want to seem as if I'm countering stage. You mm. understand what I'm saying? I might not be coming across as clear, but I run that risk of yep. Of, of mm. people saying, oh, I don't need to go to stage because I can see here. Well, and, and, and yeah. We're all in that space now as theater makers around the world because the theaters um, are closed and everyone's moving their work onto the digital platform. Yeah. So then the question is, we'll all adapt to making theater on screen because on screen it used to be the small screen as they call television or film. But now on screen is Zoom. Zoom is a place. WhatsApp is a place, Vimeo, Skype, they're all platforms, they're all stations that we can go to to enjoy theater. So what well, we can go in, uh, Akiva, we can go, but within this digital space, we have also realized that there are some people who can't go. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now yeah. no, no, you're hitting, now you're hitting bone for me. And I'm mm -hmm. going to throw out this last question to you. Now just think into this space with me. And the question is as much as a, a question, as much as it is a dreamscape. So you do not have to be um, realistic in, in, in responding to this question. You, you don't even have to be literal because your response to this question will create the world. So if, you, if we are to create... A world. Here's my question. I'm going to take this ROI, return on investment, and I'm going to turn it up on top of its head. And my question about the ROI, if human lives mattered, what would be the ROI that playwrights can guarantee? As a playwright, if human lives really matter, what is the return on investment that the work you're creating at Sistrin, the work you're creating at Soul Art, the work you're creating at D DMH Productions, what are you giving us back? A better world. Thank you. A better world, an opportunity to express self and express issues and talk it out and not fight it out an opportunity to see yourself on stage and to hear your story on stage and to, and to validate yourself as a person. And, and, and if you have a world of people who feel validated, you have a better world. And I think also, um, you know, human and social development is important to any country. And, and why would I want to, to be a company um, in a country that has conflict, in a country that economically cannot thrive because its citizens are not able to make um, worthwhile decisions or, 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 or are able to be employed, or citizens who believe that Jamaica is a, is a space that I belong, you know? And I think sometimes they don't see, they see the money in the hand, but, but who is making these decisions about the money. And how will they get the money if, if, if we're in a country that's in anarchy and a country that is not economically mm -hmm. stable because its citizens themselves are not stable people. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? And so theater for me allows expression. It allows reflection. It encourages growth. It, it, it is rooted in development. Thank it you. is about... Um, behavior change. It's about yep. attitudes and perception. Everything. It, it, it is things. really about engendering a citizenry yes. in a nation yes. that makes the place 
um, you know, we create the place of choice to live, work, raise families, and do business. And do business. Thank and you. Do business. And, and we Thank can put you, that Dalia. up on all we want. The place will never be that place unless the citizens develop the attitudes, the beliefs, and the behavior that will take us there. And theater is the vehicle that will do that. Yep. And what's the ROI for you? For me, um, I, I agree with Dela and, and Susan and the R or whatever. It, for me, is that at the end of the day, I know that if I went to a space that I'm engaging two persons to 10,000 to 100,000 persons, at the end of the day, we have a better Jamaica, a better Caribbean, and a better world that the men, the men, the men who are selling the, the missile and the guns and the this and the whatever it is, won't have to be able to be selling them anymore because we are living in a space where everybody is now looking out for each other and loving each other in a more peaceful and understanding way. Because at the end of the day, I am no more, I don't have to be busting my head now. How am I going to go over new lands now? So I talk to the women them who over there who just called me to tell me that two women over there is being battered because of um, COVID-19 because the man can't get no work and him home more regular now than any other time because him can't go to the bar, him can't go go fish, him can't go work, him can't go on any side. So those are the kind of things we have to deal with. And he doesn't have the language to deal with his frustration when he can't get away much. from his woman or he can't get away from the pit of So he yes. don't have the language to, and the language he has is a frustration that as Delia said earlier comes out of his body. Right? So the boof, the buff, the hard language, the power of dynamics, these are the la- this is what is in the collective consciousness. Yeah. Theater then brings a shift in language, deep mm-hmm. understanding. What else can I do with my children? How can I take this time to learn about them? Because I don't spend a lot of time with them. How can I take this time to learn from them? Because I've had to work 12 hour days for the past X amount of the years that these children have been born. And so, now I have this opportunity to, to sit with them, to engage with them, to help they, them do their own work. Theater gives us that language. Theater yeah. gives us point of inquiry. You know, one of my favorite plays is, um, so several, several favorite plays, but there are two of them. I love anything that anyone writes about a Nancy, but a Nancy and Pat. At like Beckett's Waiting for Godot. If you look at Waiting for Godot, is these two men on this journey, on this, this way, this pathway, and they're waiting for Godot, right? Who is Godot? Well, I don't know. what. And in the, you know, I don't think there's anyone who could ever watch that play and not either be entertained, but also find the, the existential cerebral parts of life that make you feel like a human being in that story, you know, mm-hmm. something you can learn from. So I think that the ROI, um, yes, we have a, um, a, a member of the audience, MJ Music says, theater gives us vocabulary. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to move, I'm going to keep driving this bus down that road. And I'm going to say, as we vision, as we vision into the future, COVID, 
beyond COVID, beyond the, the racial and social uprisings mm -hmm. of 2020. What are we, what is, what is your dream for, the, for theater, not only in, in the Jamaican space, but even in the diaspora, right? Um, what is your vision? What is your dream? What are you bringing with you as a playwright from this time through the gateway of, um, of, this, of this era that we, we, we call COVID-19 era? Right? What are you bringing with you? What is the, the vocabulary? What are you bringing with you and through this time? What's your dream for the Jamaican space? Mm. We can start with anyone. Who, and if you want to take a little pause just to think it out and then speak. Mm. No, I can I mean I, I I one of one of my things is how we as a Jamaican brand or how says something about reggae music and, mm. and reggae is an extension of our expression as a people mm. and so for Jamaican theater I want to see the extension of that expression make that kind of global impact mm. because I believe that we have the capacity to do that we have the vocabulary we have the stories to tell um, but I want us to be at a space even within ourselves that we realize that now in the digital time, we have access to people and markets that we probably would never have. And that as the world looks to Jamaica, music and even as a geographic space to escape COVID, mm -hmm. how are we as practitioners preparing and creating um, content and work that will be that space, that healing, that place of, of resistance, rebellion, of recovery, you know, and of mm -hmm. taking people to places where they can be their better selves. So for me, that, that's always my preoccupation in how can we as theater catch up, catch up with the rest of the expressions that we have as a people that have made a global mark. Mm. Um, I think for me, first of all, I what I would love to see is for theater to happen. <laughs> I don't know what post-COVID is going to look like. And as I understand and appreciate the shift, the necessary shift to um, the online platform, I'm, I'm such a passionate lover of theater in its true, live, authentic expression that I'm praying to God that we can go back there in, in some way. Um, but I would like to see collaboration. I would like to see um, a merging of resources so that our impacts can be greater, so that we can um, force the powers that be, whether it be locally or internationally, to say, okay, this needs support. You know, when, when we try to get support individually, it doesn't work. It hasn't worked. But if we can come together and say, listen, as this force this force that is theatre in Jamaica mm -hmm. that cannot be ignored because of all come together to form, you know, to, to, to challenge what now exists and in a way that cannot be ignored because I really believe that theatre is an underutilized, undervalued tool for the solution of many of our problems. Mm -hmm. But individually nobody's going to hear us nobody's going to listen we have to join forces and knock the walls down um that is what i want to see lana what do you want to see what's your dream for me i agree with dela i agree with susan 
we have to start working together. I want to see where, not just in Jamaica, but, but across the Caribbean, where um, the performing art and the whole just drama. It's not just um, dance and music. It's also visual arts become mm -hmm. part of, and parcel of that process. Because with insisting we use visual art as part of our healing process to be able to engage and to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I want to see is that there is a, uh, an entertainment policy within Jamaica as well as within the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And and how can we used to do it in our early days when we could go across the Caribbean. I remember when we used to do um Caribbean tour, right? And Carifesta, I don't even know what is happening to Carifesta right now. Perhaps yes. Delia and Susan can tell me, <laughs> right? And and Carifesta was a space where we used to engage and collaborate across country, et cetera, et cetera, and work together, right? I remember when Sistrin used to go to other, um, to North America and engage other performing arts, um, theater company. Um, in our early days, we used to have um, a group across Caribbean calling themselves popular theater um, artists and whatever it is. I don't even know if that still exists anymore. Mm. So there are a lot of stuff that for, we, we need to do and we need to start working together. As Susan said, and as Dela said, if we don't do what we have to do, then um, we'll get stuck. And um, one of the main things for me is that Jamaica theater has its value. It has its space. It just, I just we. And don't care if our English, if our dialect, if our patois, if our drumming, if our dance, whatever it is, when we go out there and do it anywhere across the world, Everybody's going crazy. So why, 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 why we can't get it in a way that just like 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 the music? Why why? Because we are in silo and operating in silo. Well, you know the the issues that you bring up are you know the reason we wanted to Akiba Baka Arts wanted to speak into the Jamaican space. We've said it before, we're developing a new work that's based on a Jamaican narrative, but we also wanted to enter the space and we wanted to be additive to the space. And the questions we're asking within the, the Jamaican theater space are the questions that are being asked in the US. Playwrights are having these conversations among themselves here. They're having these conversations in Berlin. They're having these conversations in Chile. They, the, the same, and it's so much can be heard if we're able to listen to each other and to expound and expand on the conversation in each area, because someone in, you know, in, in the Roma community uh, may hear an aspect that mirrors their story and may have picked up a gem from this conversation. Somebody from the Blue Mountains may hear a part of this story and may have picked up a gem that influences their lives as well, you know? So it's so important for us to be speaking into these different spaces and to know that the experiences, boundaries, and interests that we have among ourselves are shared globally, you know? And, and speaking up and speaking out and speaking in dialogue helps us to, to, to pick up gems along the way. And I've picked up quite a few gems in listening to this conversation. Um, the speakers can't see the chat, so I'm just going to share with you writers that you have quite a few fans in the chat here, and they're saying, uh, uh, Althea Charlene is saying, you know, we need to see more theater work from Jamaica to the U.S., you know, we need to see the work coming to us, because 
the, there is a large diaspora of the Caribbean. Eight, over 800,000 um, people of Jamaican heritage live in the United States alone. Um, so continue to develop the work that you are creating, you know, continue to build and push beyond the, 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 the barriers and, and around language and, and audience size. And another thing to, to say, you know, to some of the founders is, you know, brand Jamaica and the Jamaican audience is not just limited to the people who are on the island. So you need the resources to develop your work so that you can reach, you know, uh, so, somebody like Grace. I I, 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 don't, I can't live without my Grace Aki and my Grace Makril, you know. And if I see Grace put their brand on one of your plays, I'm going to definitely, you know, these are some things we want to think about. I, I just gave Grace a huge plug, which they didn't pay for. <laughs> so as we move on with these conversations, as, you, as you've noticed, um, we're building. We're in week seven and we're building and we're building. And now we go to week eight. In week eight, we move on to an aspect of Jamaican life and Jamaican theater that is not often spoken about. Queer narratives from the Jamaican stage. This will be an, a conversation that elevates and celebrates narratives of people from the LGBTQ um, communities of Jamaica, the writers, the scholars, the actors. We will be joined by Carl Williams, Webster McDonald, and Simone Harris. At this time, I want to thank profusely Lana Finnegan, Delia Harris, and Suzanne Beadle for joining us today, and also to thank our sponsors, HowlRound and the Siegel Center. Jamaicans have a saying, when we depart, we say, walk good. And we people in the theater, we say, see you on the boards. So what we're going to say is, walk good pun the boards. You hear?